All righty. Well, good morning to everyone. And uh, it is uh, uh, Wednesday morning and uh, April the 8th. And uh, praise God for another beautiful day that he's given us. Another opportunity to be uh, back with you by live stream this morning. And uh, for our Bible study, now we're doing things a little bit different in our Bible study. And so... Um, uh, Pastor May is going to come just in a moment after prayer time, and he's going to share with you a um, uh, Bible study on the last Passover. And so uh, I hope you got your hearts in tune and ready for that. Tonight, let me give you this, uh, 7 o'clock, we'll continue our study. Uh, we're actually studying the, uh, through the book of Exodus, but we've detoured just a little bit uh, to the uh, offerings. Uh, we last studied in the book of Exodus on the brazen altar. And uh, we have took a detour to study some of the offerings that has, was offered at the Brazen Altar. And tonight, uh, we'll talk about the drink offering and the peace offering. So uh, uh, you uh, join us this evening at 7 o'clock for that. And uh, good study of the Word of God. Always good to study the Bible. And, and I hope you've been reading your Bible and staying faithful uh, to prayer and uh, Bible study, how important that is in the life of a Christian, especially in the day in which we live. And we need to continue to pray and seek God's wisdom and guidance. So uh, with that in mind, let me go over a few things, um, and we're going to have prayer time. So if you have a prayer request this morning, I want you to put that up on the, up on the uh, Facebook here, and I will try to catch it and add it to our prayer list. Um, let me give you some announcements in the way of announcements this evening. Uh, besides the Bible study, at 5.30, Pastor Mays will be having teen service, uh, and that's uh, right here, live stream on Facebook. And then uh, tonight at 6.30, you master club, uh, children, parents, uh, you, your grandparents, you get your children, gather them up at 6.30. This evening, Pastor Mays is going to be doing the resurrection eggs and a great lesson for the young people there. That's at 6.30 tonight, so keep that in mind. And then, of course, our... Uh, Bible study at 7, uh, and uh, so all those events you can be able to tune into. Uh, Friday, we have our prayer time. We've been doing that live stream this Friday. be Good Friday, so you join us at 6 o'clock on Friday. And then Sunday, uh, some things we're going to do Sunday, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, 7 a.m. It's Easter Sunday. We're going to be here doing a uh, short sunrise service for you uh, just to honor the resurrection and share some scripture and maybe sing a song, whatever the Lord leads us to do. That is at uh, 7, uh, uh, 7 o'clock on Sunday morning. And uh, so uh, you, you plan to join us. Get up early and join us Sunday morning. Then also Sunday at 11 a.m., uh, myself and Pastor Mays, and we'll be bringing you a, a message uh, from the Word of God concerning the cross and the resurrection. So you join us Sunday for our live stream. Now we're going to have no services uh, Sunday evening. It's Easter Sunday. And I'm going to be going to see my dad. And a few things going on there. So we've decided just to uh, forego the evening service on Sunday. Uh, due to the fact it's Easter. So uh, spend time as best you can uh, with your family. I know this things are running a little different. but But praise God. For his goodness. Okay, I see a prayer request here for Harvey Stepp. Uh, he has now been taken off the ventilator, and so continue to pray for Harvey Stepp. Uh, he was in the accident, and he suffered a uh, heart attack, I believe it was, but but you continue to pray for him. That is Ashley, Harvey's stepfather, and so remember uh, them today. Also, uh, let's pray for the folks on our prayer list. Uh, you received a a prayer request this week for Joe Colombo in Pittsburgh in the hospital. Uh, so remember him. Continue to pray for John Barber today, and uh, uh, pray for pray for his uh, soul and and uh, pray for his health as well. I want to remember our lost people. I know there's people on your heart and mind. Uh, you're praying for to be saved. Continue to pray for revival in our land, as we thus need revival. And I believe we're seeing the makings of revival, uh, even in the, even in the day in which we live uh pray for the um, families that lost their loved ones this past couple weeks uh the dickerson family short family remember them and uh, yes pray for uh, 
Cole and Lily and his family, the loss of his dad. Uh, pray for them today as well. And let's remember uh, uh, other requests that I see here on our prayer sheet. Michael and Cheryl Cruz, pray for them today. Uh, of course, pray for the church and uh, in this difficult day. And, and uh, uh, of course, God's meeting the need and God's taking care of the church. And we thank you for doing your part today and continuing to see that the needs of the church are met and God is graciously blessing us. I think our our um, uh, our times of uh, inconvenience is God's time of victory, and so we got to remember that. You know, we shared some of that uh, the other night and with Joseph and and uh, some of those things. Uh, you know, they were inconvenience, but God got victory through uh, while the circumstance that they were going through. So let's pray for God's glory and let's pray for revival and. Uh, uh, pray for our missionaries. I know many of our missionaries need help this during this crisis, and, and they're facing issues as well as we are, probably more so than we are. So let's pray for our missionaries today. And, of course, health needs. Uh, folks still have health needs, still battling cancer, still battling sickness, uh, still battling surgeries and recovering from surgeries. And a lot of people on our prayer list today that just need your prayers, and so let's remember them. And... Uh, Pray for healing, pray for help, pray for God's guidance in this difficult day in which we live. But thanks be to God. I'm so glad that God is still in control, and uh, I know you are as well. And we thank you for joining in uh, by your live stream today. And uh, I know this is not the way we want to do things, but it's kind of where we are right now. So anyway... I haven't said that. We're going to go to prayer just shortly. I'm going to turn Pastor Mays loose. He's got a good lesson this morning, and I want you to have your Bibles ready and um, to follow him today in his lesson that he's going to give you. And uh, we need uh, we need good Bible lessons. Okay, let's see. I pray for uh, pray for Robert uh, Rednick. Remember him as Melanie's father. And uh, so let's pray for him today. His health and his salvation. Yeah. Uh, uh, we need to pray especially for his salvation today. No greater sickness than to be lost, especially in a day in which we live and the events taking place. Well, thank you again. And I want you to pray with us as we pray. And then we're going to give Pastor Mays the remainder of the time this morning. Share from the Word of God. Uh, great things God is doing. So let's look to the Lord in prayer today. Our Father God, which art in heaven, O oh God, as we gather in your presence, Lord, one more time, uh, Father, we're thankful, God, that we have the capability and we have the means, Father, in which to gather together. And, Lord, we gather together in prayer today, knowing and realizing, God, you're still the God that answers prayer. You're still God that hears us and helps us, Lord, in times of trouble. We thank you, God, for being present even this morning. Lord, we see... The beautiful day you set for us, even though the clouds has rolled in and the rain's probably going to come. But, Father, we know that that is just part of your goodness to us. For, Father, without the rain, we'd be in trouble. And, Lord, we thank you, God, for rain. And we thank you, God, for your grace and mercy, Father. Lord, that rains in our hearts today. Even in a time of chaos and crisis, God, you're still reigning. You still are in control. Pray for our nation today, God, for the leadership of our nation. Pray for our president, God, you'll be with him. Lord, give him the guidance and the, and the uh, unction that he needs. And Father, help us, Lord, as pastors today, Lord, to make right decisions, do right things. Father, help us not to be out of order, but Lord, help us to be in order. And Lord, sometimes we don't always understand what that is. And so, God, we ask you, Lord, to help us, Lord, to be an uplift to somebody. And Lord, that we use the Word of God to be our guide and our strength and our help. Thank you, Lord, for Bible studies, Lord, that it was reaching farther than we could reach, Lord. I ever could imagine, Father, for the Word of God is going forth all over the world and souls are being saved. And, and Father, people are hearing the gospel and hearing the good Word of God. And, Lord, how we need our Bible, how we need people in tune with the Word of God. Bless Pastor Mays this morning as he shares with us from the Word today. Give us something, Lord, good today from the precious Word of God. It will help us, Lord, 
uh, to look uh, up to you, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we pray for our needs. We pray for the needs of the church. We thank you, God, for meeting those needs. Thank you, God, for doing far more than we can ever imagine. Father, for helping us, Lord, and meeting our needs, Father, in this time of crisis. And we pray, Father, for all the live stream services that will take place, Lord, uh, today and even this weekend. We pray, Father, that God will work in mighty way and many souls will be saved, Lord. We can see people come to Christ. And, Lord, we pray for the needs of our people, Lord. I pray for these in the hospital. Uh, Lord, I pray for Joe Colombo and his need and John Barber. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Candy being home today. Lord, we ask you to continue to lift her up and comfort her father and her recovery. Father, we pray for Texas as she continues to recover today. Pray for Sharon, Lord, fighting the cancer. Continue to pray for my dad, Lord. You lift him up, Father, and decisions we've got to make and things we've got to do. We thank you, God, for being good to us, helping us. Pray for Harvey Stepp today, Father. Thank you, Lord. He's off that ventilator. We pray, Father, he'll soon be able to come home. Lord, continue to touch him today. Robert Rednick, we pray for his soul today, Father. Oh, God, that he might be saved. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to send the gospel his way. Lord, touch his heart and, Lord, give him strength today, Father, Lord, and uh, touch his body with healing, but most of all, God, his soul. We pray for other folks, Lord. I know that people have in their heart today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. I believe we're seeing the beginning, Lord, of end times. And, Father, how we need to be saved. Lord, how we need to be ready uh, for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, you help us, Father, as we try to rightly divide the word of truth that people realize the need to be saved. Pray for our folks and their health needs. And, Lord, bless them today. Lord, I, and I know all over uh, Facebook people have got somebody to pray for. So, God, I pray for them. And, Lord, I pray for these the families that's lost their loved ones. The Lily family, the Dickerson family, the Short family, comfort them, God, in this hour of trouble. Lord, as only you can. Pray for our missionaries today, God, all over the world. They're working in harsh conditions. And, Father, they're facing the virus such as we are. Lord, help us not to uh, uh, be slack in giving what we're supposed to give to them, Father. Lord, as they continue to spread the word of God. Lord, we pray, Father, for folks uh, that's listening in that may have a special request today. Maybe have it's unspoken. Maybe they can't share it. Father, you know what that need is. So, God, we ask you to meet that in a mighty way. Lord, again, thank you again. We pray, Father, you'll quickly roll this cloud of disease away. And, Father, you'll uh, be, allow us once again together, Lord, in the house of God. And I know, Father, as I studied on Paul this morning, how many doors got closed for Paul, Father, things that he wanted to do. But, Father, you never closed the door. You didn't open one for greater things. Father, that he would accomplish. And I believe we're seeing that today. And though you closed the door of what we're used to, Lord, you've opened the door of greater opportunities, Father, to help us to reach farther than we can ever reach, Lord, that souls might be saved. Now, God bless this Bible study today. Thank you for this word of God, this precious Lord to us. Lord, help us. Lord, be mindful. Uh, be patient. And, Lord, help us to have the mind to serve God today. I know Satan wants to entertain us with all kind of things. But, Lord, let us clear our minds this morning and be open to God's holy word. And, Father, you have your way. Work in the hearts of people. Forgive us, God, of our sin and our failures. And, Lord, you lead us in the way that is pleasing unto thee. In Christ's eternal name we ask and pray. And amen and amen. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, other prayer requests are coming up. And uh, so you, you see them. Pray for them. Sa uh, Sandra talks about her sister-in-law, Judy Hirsch, possible return of lung cancer. And, of course, Cheryl and Michael want to pray for them and remember them. And so you, you continue to put your request up. Folks will see them, and folks will pray for them as they go through their day and pray. Well, Pastor Mays has a Bible study this morning, so I'm going to turn things over to him. You get your Bible ready and give him your attention this morning. Amen. All right, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Well, I can't see you, but I, I see you, uh, your name on the screen, so that's as good as it's going to get. Uh, I wanted to share with you, Pastor asked me to do Bible study this morning, and uh, I've been studying the last several months, and we've been talking to our teenagers about the last days of Christ on earth. And we began here, uh, pretty much this point we're going to start right now, at the last Passover. And uh, we've been uh, uh, going through um, uh, talking about the crucifixion. We're on the resurrection now. And, uh, but we're several months in this. And so I've learned a lot. And, uh, and what I've learned, I want to pass that on and share with you this morning. So this being Easter week, 
as we're, our hearts and minds has uh, been focused on uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and uh, or should be uh, this week, uh, I wanted to do this study. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 22, Luke chapter 22, and uh, we'll be there. And uh, I posted uh, a couple days ago uh, some uh, a reading ahead of time. I hope you had time to read some of that. I believe it'll be a, a help to you this morning. Uh, we're not going to be able to go over all those scriptures this morning. Uh, this is going to be a rather uh, lengthy uh, study this morning. I'm going to uh, try to be mindful of that, but there's a lot of information. Uh, and so we're going to try to go down to verse number 23 in this chapter, but there's a whole lot of in-betweens uh, to fill in. But I think it'll be a blessing. hope it will uh, be an encouragement to you this morning. So in Luke chapter 22, here we find as uh, uh, Christ is coming into Jerusalem, uh, of course we know uh, this uh, last Sunday we... uh uh, celebrated Palm Sunday, uh, the day that Christ would, uh, his triumphal em- entry would come into Jerusalem. We'll share a little bit more about that here just in a minute. And, and so in the week following here is what some call, I guess, the Passion Week or uh, the, the week that is leading up uh, to uh, the, the, the crucifixion uh, here by Friday. And so uh, as we begin here in verse number one, we're just going to kind of go a verse at a time, split this up and uh, look at uh, several verses and groups here. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Of course, we know that God instituted uh, the Passover to the nation of Israel. Uh, that was committed to them. And, uh, and, and we know that from Exodus chapter number 12. That was some of the reading I wanted you to do this week. Uh, uh, we're not going to have time to go there. Pastor spent uh, much time while we're in the book of Exodus there in chapter number 12. So hopefully that's, hopefully that's fresh in your mind. Uh, as uh, the Lord instituted that Passover on that day, He said it was going to be the beginning of months uh, for them. And uh, you remember there in Exodus chapter number 12 uh, that on the 10th day of the month Nisan, the, the first day of the month of that year, uh, that they were to, to search the lambs out and every household get a lamb. They were to inspect it and watch it until the 14th day of the month of that month, Nisan, on the evening of the 14th. Uh, they were going to slay that. And so uh, and what we're going to see here, we're going to look at that uh, as concerning uh, this, what we're going to call the last Passover, uh, because uh, really it was the last one necessary. And, uh, and here we're going to see in this passage of Scriptures uh, the connecting link between the Old and New Testaments here uh, in this passage and in this feast. And so it's uh, uh, no coincidence... Uh, that Christ is uh, getting ready to die exactly on the feast of Passover. He's going to be uh, he's going to die and be buried on the Passover, and he's going to raise again on the first fruits. And then fifty days later uh, is going to be the day of Pentecost, exactly to the day which is the day the church was birthed. And so God is working according to all these feasts here. You find those feasts in Leviticus twenty three. And so now it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, uh, this was uh, the climax in Israel uh, uh, nationally. This was uh, one of the uh, highest days that they celebrated. And so what you have to imagine, I want you to picture yourself as uh, Christ is in Jerusalem now. Uh, And, of course, a pastor preached about that not long ago. Jesus journeyed to Jerusalem. But here he is. He's back in Jerusalem. He knows that they're looking for him. Uh, He knows that uh, they're going to kill him and uh, crucify him. And uh, he, he knows all these things ahead of time. But yet he goes. But I want you to, in your mind, to picture this. Now, everybody from all the corners of Israel is coming to Jerusalem. Why? Because the temple is in Jerusalem, and they're going to celebrate the Passover there in Jerusalem. So uh, nationally, this was a a, a climax of the year. Uh, It was a a time that marked that great pilgrimage where people from all over Israel would come uh, and and be there for these uh, several days of the feast. The unleavened bread uh, feast uh, would last seven days here. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute. And so this is what time it is. Uh, now, uh, John and uh, Matthew gives us a little bit exact time here, what we're getting ready to read. Uh, and when we get to verses 2 through 6, we're going to read about the betrayal uh, of, uh, of Christ or the, the beginning of that plot. And so he's going to tell us during that week when it began. So understand this. We're in the week now uh, on Sunday, beginning that first day of the week. Uh, here's where in this story that Christ rode in uh, on Palm Sunday is what we call it. And, and they was crying Hosanna to the king. But now uh, we're, uh, the, the Bible says here the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And so if uh, I'm just going to read some of these verses this morning. John 13, 1 says, Now before the Feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. All right, uh, Pastor, our sound's coming in and out a little bit. Give me a little bit of speaker over there. It's blue. 
I'm trying to adjust the sound right here. Give me a second. It's all blue right now. It's cutting in and out. They're saying coming back in. All right. All right, I'm trying to get the sound adjusted here. Uh, so let me let me know how that's going for you. I, I can't. I don't know on my end uh, unless you tell me. Okay. And so uh, Jesus knew uh, that his hour was come. And so uh, this is not going to take Jesus by surprise. It didn't take God by surprise. It's no coincidence that uh, according to the um, uh, feast of the Passover, uh, it, it, that this is happening. And and so, pastor's going to work on my volume here. And in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 2, the Bible says, And ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, when the Son of Man is betrayed and crucified. All right, uh, all right so we're in Luke chapter 22. All right, and we're getting some okays here. All right, and I'm just reading a couple of these uh, verses. Just stay in um, Luke 22 right now. And uh, the reason I read that in John and Matthew is to point out that uh, this plot that we're getting ready to, to read about is about two days here prior uh, to the Feast of the Passover, which would put it uh, somewhere around uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, okay? Or Tuesday, actually, because Thursday evening, what you got to understand, uh, in, 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 according to the Jews, uh, their calendar at 6 o'clock, at 6 o'clock the evening before began their next day. And so uh, we're going to, uh, uh, when we get to the Passover here just in a minute, it's going to be actually Thursday evening at about 6 o'clock or about sunset uh, would be the beginning of actually Friday morning. So the Jewish day began at 6 p.m. Uh, the, the evening prior. And so the Passover is going to be observed on that Thursday. Friday he's going to, Christ is going to be up here before Pilate. He's going to be crucified and then uh, buried that evening. He's going to be in the grave Saturday. And then Sunday morning, the first day of the week, he's going to raise again. All right, and so that's where we're at. And so uh, this uh, Passover here, uh, it's drawing nigh. It's about two days out. <clears throat> and Jesus has just given his um, uh, disciples, the, 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 of course, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. You read about that. And so uh, he, we see that. And so uh, this marked a great pilgrimage, everybody coming to Israel or to Jerusalem during this time. Uh, it was a remembrance for them. Uh, this was the beginning of the birth of their nation, much like we celebrate the 4th of July. Uh, this would have been a, a day such as that, a memorial to them, uh, because it was the beginning of months to them. God said that in Exodus 12. Uh, and it also brought hope for the coming Messiah, because the Passover lambs and all these lambs pointed future. Uh, the Passover pointed to the future lamb, the future Messiah that would come. And it was also a time of reunion for friends and loved ones to come together. So it's an exciting time uh, in Israel. And for the past two months... And all the synagogues all over Israel, uh, the priests and, and the, the scribes have been teaching concerning the Passover. And so uh, all the hearts and minds uh, during this time as these pilgrims coming to Jerusalem was on the Passover. And the Passover centered around one thing, and that was the Lamb. And so if there was ever a time that Israel should have recognized their Messiah. And it's no coincidence that, that God allowed Christ to die on this time because it was significant here during this Passover feast that all of those lambs of the Old Testament, all of those sacrifices and all those Passovers observed in the years and centuries past all pointed to this one particular time when Jesus, as John would say, Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, and this is why we're going to call it the final or the last Passover. And uh, we'll talk about that here just in a minute. And so understand that's what's going on. That's the background. Uh, now with this Feast of Unleavened Bread, what would have happened is the evening before it began uh, that every house there in Israel, uh, they would take a candle in the evening and they would search all of the dark corners of their house and they would make sure that there was no crumb or no piece or no portion of any leavened bread in the house, and God told them to do that. You can read about that again in Exodus chapter number 12. But they were to make a diligent search in all the house, and the Bible said that they weren't to have any leaven. And uh, God told them if they had leaven in the house, they were to be cut off from the congregation. And so it was a diligent search made. And there's a wonderful spiritual application there uh, that you and I, uh, as we're getting ready to talk about here just in a minute, uh, the Lord's table, uh, you know, that time of examination, and even uh, not just then, but all of the time in our life. Uh, and the light represents that candle, represents the Word of 
God and we're to search the, the deepest, darkest corners of our heart and soul and confess our sins and make things right with God. Leaven's always a picture of sin. And so during this Feast of Unleavened Bread for the next seven days, they're going to be eating unleavened bread. And so that evening, and so the house will be purged. And if there was any leaven found in the house, any leavened bread, it was taken out and destroyed. And, uh, and also dealing with our sins. If there's sin in our life, we need to get it right with God. We need to take it out, confess it and forsake it and destroy it as it were and get it under the blood of Christ and search it out uh, by the word of God helps us do that. And so that's what's going on. Here in verse number 1, uh, the approaching feast. Now, uh, I want to give you a little bit more insight about the timing of this and God's timing and God's Word. And as again, I said this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy study, but, but I'm going to try to share some good things uh, uh, that's going to help you understand what's going on in the background to know the Bible and understand that the Bible is the living Word of God and, and, and that God knows exactly what He is doing. His timing is perfect. Uh, even when uh, Jesus was uh, four days late, He's still right on time but because God knows exactly what's going on. So what I want us to do right now, I'm going to look. I want to show you a little bit about this timing and the prophecies of the Old Testament of what's occurring here in this particular week. We call it the Passion Week and beginning there on Palm Sunday and ending uh, on Resurrection Sunday. And so for this one week, seven days here, uh, the events that are going on. But uh, Daniel gives us a little prophecy concerning this. And so what I want to do just for a moment here is if you'll hold your place in Luke chapter 22, uh, I know we're still in verse number 1, but I want you to go back to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter number 9, and uh, I want us to read uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 uh, through 27. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And this is going to, uh, when, I, when I studied this and I found this out, I started to shout. We've shared a little bit of this in our school of the Bible. We studied the book of Daniel. Uh, but God knows exactly what he is doing. And uh, God's right on time. Uh, this thing that's happening in the world today is not taking God by surprise. Uh, God still knows when the end's going to be. And uh, he's still watching over his children. So in Daniel 9.24, uh, this is a prophecy of Daniel that God gave him. Now I want you to notice this. And I don't want to confuse you, but I want to get into some, uh, some meat right here. This is a little bit deep. So let's look at it here in Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. And that's Christ. All right, verse 25, now therefore uh, and under, uh, know therefore and understand that now this is what I want you to pay attention to. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now that's what we were uh, talking about last night when Cyrus gave the commandment to go back and as the Ezra and Nehemiah, they're going to go back and rebuild the city from that time forth uh, to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven Weeks. All right, now we're going to study this here just in a second. Uh, weeks in the Bible can mean weeks of days, but also weeks of years and weeks according to periods of time. That's what he's talking about here uh, in these seven weeks. So he's saying from the commandment, uh, when the, the Jews begin to come back into the land from the captivity, as we talked about that last night in the school of the Bible, the remnant began to come back from Babylon. Uh, to rebuild the temple and then to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem from the time that Cyrus gave that commandment to rebuild until the time of Messiah, the anointed, the Holy One, was going to be seven weeks. Now, not seven uh, weeks as we think of it in seven-day weeks, but this is going to be seven periods of time. And I'm going to read you some notes here on that here just in a minute. Now, look, uh, look in... Um, uh, continue on there. In three score and two weeks, uh, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks, all right, uh, shall Messiah be cut off. And that's when Christ is going to die. But not for himself. Uh, and the people of the, prince, uh, of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be uh, with a flood and to the end of the war uh, desolations are determined. All right, and so there's some prophetic significance here going on, and the reason we read that here, if you'll just... Uh, I'm going to read you some notes that I have here on that portion of Scripture and how it deals with where we're at in Luke 22 and these uh, the days concerning Christ. So there's pr prophetic significance. Daniel tells us it's going to be a period of seven weeks, but understand that, uh, that it's not a period of weeks as we know it. So there's going to be... Uh, Daniel will go on. He talks about there in that first verse in 24, seven weeks, all right? And so again, it's a multiple of seven, uh, seven being the number of perfection. But let's look here. I'm going to share some information with you. And so Daniel predicts 70 weeks 
uh, that are determined upon his people. And the notes that I'm reading from uh, is from uh, uh, Explore the Book by J. Sidlow Baxter. It's one of the references we use for School of the Bible. And so I'm going to read uh, uh, his uh, comments on this and, uh, and uh, what he's talking about here. So Daniel predicts 70 weeks that are determined upon his people. From the time of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the time that Messiah would be cut off uh, was 483 years. And if you divide that by seven, Daniel's seven weeks, you get 69 weeks. All right, you say, well, wait a minute. Daniel uh, prophesied 70 weeks. All right, we're going to talk about that. All right, and so if you would take that from the time exactly from the, the, the Cyrus gave the commandment to rebuild the, the city of Jerusalem, rebuild the temple and those things, and you would fast forward it all the way uh, up here to the time this week that Messiah was cut off is exactly... And this is what I'm trying to show you, how your Bible is alive and it's real and God makes no mistakes. It's exactly 483 years. And you divide that number by seven, Daniel's seven weeks, and you get 69 weeks. All right? Now, hold on. In the Hebrew culture, there was not only weeks of days, but also weeks of years. And the remaining week to make 70 is going to happen during the tribulation period, okay? And when the Antichrist violates his covenant with the Jews and desecrates Jerusalem. So there's a break there in Daniel's prophecy. Uh, Up to the 69th week is when Messiah is cut off, and then there's still another week that remains. And remember, it's not just a week of seven days, but a period of time of years. All right, that's going to happen. All right, the 70th week has not happened yet. That will happen as Christ talked about the the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel. That's when the Antichrist will come. So there's a pause right there. And right now, we're living in that pause period. Uh, We're living between the 69th and the 70th week in this prophecy because it's the church age. Why was it not mentioned? Well, Paul tells us that the church was a mystery uh, in the Old Testament, Ephesians chapter 3, that was revealed. uh, This church age was uh, the dispensation sensation was given and revealed to Paul. It was a mystery not known in the Old Testament to then, all right? And so without getting any deeper than that, understand that, that from, uh, from the rebuilding of the temple or, or the commandment given till Messiah was cut off was going to be uh, 69 weeks. And so that worked out exactly, historically, it worked out exactly to 483 years, divide that by seven, and you get the 69 uh, prophetic weeks that Daniel was talking about. All right, and so the edict to build Jerusalem was given on the first month, the first month of Nisan in 445 B.C., and you can find that in Nehemiah 2.5, and it would be equivalent to what we would call our Julian date of March 14th, 445 B.C., all right? All right, and now when we're talking about these prophetic years, a prophetic year is 360 days. It's not 365 like we know it, but the prophetic year is 360 days in a prophetic year. All right, and this prophecy by Daniel was to the exact day in its fulfillment because on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem upon the, uh, the foal in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy given in Zechariah 9.9. And you can find that account in Matthew 21. We're not going to read that this morning for sake of time. But on that day, this is what I'm trying to get. I've said all that to say this. On the Sunday that Christ rode into the Jerusalem, and this is where your Bible comes alive, it was exactly to the day, 483 years from the commandment to rebuild the temple. And it's amazing how the Bible comes to life. And God knows exactly what Daniel prophesied it. Uh, that, that to the time. And so this week that Christ would be cut off, a man by the name of Sir Robert Anderson writes this, According to the Jewish customs and the writings of Josephus in his book of wars, chapter uh, uh, number 6, chapter 5, paragraph 3, uh, and Josephus, he was a Jewish historian, uh, the Lord went into Jerusalem on the 8th of Nisan, uh, and you find that in John eleven fifty five 55 and John 12, 1, uh, which was in the year of 32 A.D., and it fell on Friday. And so the Friday prior to Palm Sunday is when Christ comes into Jerusalem. You remember the story of Lazarus and all those things there uh, taking place there in John chapter number 11. And it fell on Friday that year, and he remained in Bethany during the Sabbath. That would have been the Saturday. He remained in Bethany just outside of Jerusalem uh, in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who uh, Jesus stayed with him many times. And then uh, on that Sunday is when his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday was on the... (coughs) Excuse me. It was on the 10th of Nisan, Palm Sunday. Now remember back in Exodus chapter number uh, 12, 
that from the tenth day of the month Nisan to the fourteenth day the lamb was to be examined. And is that not what happened to Christ from that Monday, from Sunday, the Pharisees and the scribes, as Christ comes into Jerusalem that whole week, they begin to examine him. Of course, we know Friday uh, morning, early Friday in the morning, that Jesus would go to Caiaphas' house, then Annas' house, and, and Christ would be brought to Pilate, and Christ would go to Herod, and then back to Pilate, and no one could find fault in the Lamb. Hallelujah. I'm about to get excited. Uh, in the, the teaching of God's Word, it's so real, and it becomes alive. And as we know, as Christ would ride in on that 10th day of the month Nisan, that very year uh, happened to fall on the 10th day as Jesus came into the Jerusalem. And it was not by coincidence. God knows exactly what He's doing and the perfect timing that this uh, took place. And so uh, we see, and if you do the math here, and uh, it would have been around the Julian date of April 6th of 32 AD. And so if you take into consideration what we said uh, in 445 B.C., uh, from that March 14th, 445 B.C., the, the edict was given to build uh, Jerusalem. And then to April 6, 32 A.D. is exactly 483 prophetic years, all right? And uh, when you break that down and you divide that uh, 483 uh, by 360 for the days in a year, you get exactly one, 173,880 days. And that goes right in line with what, um, with what Daniel was saying. And so I, I pointed all that out. This is the time that this is occurring. And I know we're only in verse number 1 right now. And so again, if you need to go and come back and watch this again later, I'm going to teach you the whole thing today. Uh, but there, there's a lot of deep stuff here. And I believe that, that if we'll let this sink in, knowing that our Bible is alive and knowing these, uh, these uh, things that are embedded that God wants us to know about, I believe it'll help us to appreciate and understand and know in the world we live in today and especially uh, this week as we celebrate the resurrection day uh, of our, that we serve a living Savior, knowing that these minute details that God gives in His Word, knowing that He's in control of all things. All right, and so we see that's the time it's happening. That's the background uh, for uh, the, these final days of Christ here on earth. In Luke chapter number 22 as we begin that. Now uh, let's look in verses uh, 2 through 6. We're going to read verses 2 through 6. And we're going to see the plot uh, that is going on. Now Jesus is in Jerusalem. Uh, and he's, uh, and he's, he's rode through on Sunday. And that infuriated uh, the Pharisees. You remember they rebuked him uh, for the, the people crying out and saying, Hosanna, blessed is the son of David, he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're infuriated by this. They're angry. They're mad. And uh, because they're giving Jesus recognition as the Messiah, as the Christ, the Son of God. And uh, that infuriated them. And so now look in verse number 2. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. All right, and so they're, 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 they're furious. And so they want to kill Christ. They want to do away with Him. And is not that what the world wants to do today? Uh, you know, they couldn't stomach the truth. The world has a hard time stomaching the truth because here's the fact. If Jesus is who He said He is, and He was, uh, then they're accountable to Him. He's God. And they were not willing to admit that. And so in, instead of conforming to the truth, they try to do away with it and try to change it and try to kill the truth. And that's the world we live in today. Instead of accepting the truth of what God says is right and wrong and what God says is true. They try to do away with it to try to stamp it out. They try to say it's hate speech. They try to say it's, uh, it's not politically correct. They try to do away with the truth. They try to change the truth. The Bible said they changed the truth of God into a lie. But uh, this is what they're doing. Uh, but notice they feared the people. They knew that the heart of the people uh, followed Christ because of the miracles and the things He did, and they were worshiping Him. But the Pharisees didn't like Christ because Christ exposed them for who they were. Uh, they were corrupted. They were ungodly. The people up until that point looked up to these Pharisees. They were the religious leaders. They held a pious position, and they held their position by political corruption and power over the people, and they kind of held, as it were, the people under their thumb. But Jesus came onto the scene, and uh, He knew their hearts, and He exposed them uh, for, what the, and for what and who they were and so they hated him and so they wanted to do away with him now I want you to notice verse number 3 here then entered look what the Bible says Satan into Judas and surnamed Iscariot being of the number of the twelve now here I want you to see this this is very important Satan himself 
enters into Judas Iscariot to hatch this plot. All right, and so the chief priests, the scribes, the religious crowd, they are looking for means by which they can kill and get rid of Jesus. They're afraid of the people. They don't know how to accomplish this. And no doubt uh, that, that Judas gets word of this because uh, this wasn't something uh, he had, but they, they knew that the, the Pharisees hated Christ. And so uh, Satan himself enters Judas. Now I want to stop and point this out. The fact that Satan entered into Judas proves to us that Judas was never saved. You study the life of Judas Iscariot. He never calls Jesus Lord. He calls him Master but, or, or, or Rabbi or Teacher, but he never calls Jesus Lord. And so he was never saved. Because you and I that are saved, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And just like Jesus' parable of the strong man, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the demon uh, or Satan, a demon or Satan cannot inhabit a, a, a saved person because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. But the fact here is that a lost person can be inhabited and possessed by demonic spirits. But this was just not some demonic spirit. This was Satan himself. Now know this, Satan is not omnipresent as God is. And so he wants to be, uh, but he is not. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we say the devil's on our back, the devil's been bothering us. Well, probably uh, the reality of it is it's probably not Satan himself. It's one of his demons, one of his uh, army of angels that he has, uh, one of these demonic spirits that are uh, at work, and they are very powerful. But Satan himself can only be in one place at one time. And so here, uh, this is how important this is to Satan. He enters into Judas. He knows that Judas is not a saved man. He knows that Judas uh, does not honor Christ. He's just there. And there are many that are among, uh, that call themselves Christians today, that they're void of the Holy Spirit of God. They're not saved. They go to church. Uh, they show up. They present themselves as Christians. But on the inside, they're empty. And the devil knows who they are, and God knows who they are. And so uh, he has chosen, Satan has chosen and to influence and inhabit but uh, he enters, the Bible said that he entered into Judas Iscariot. And so this proves that he's not saved. And you can read about that in John 13 too. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And then over in John 13, 27, and after the sop, Satan entered into him again. And then said Jesus to him, that thou doest do quickly. And so we see that several times Satan is influencing and, and inhabiting, not just influencing, but inhabiting Judas Iscariot. That, that tells you that, uh, that, that Satan was trying to stop Jesus from going to the cross. And what Satan was trying to do, Satan knew all too well the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 that the, that the heel of the woman, uh, her seed, would bruise the head of the serpent, which was him. And, and Satan knows if Jesus goes to Calvary that it's over for him. And so he's trying to stop. And, uh, and we don't have time to get into the Garden of Gethsemane tonight, but uh, Satan was trying to... Uh, uh, set up a lynch mob there, and they were going to kill Jesus right there in the garden, but his power, in John 18, you can read about that, uh, did not allow them to do that. But here, he's empowered by Satan. That's what I want you to point out. And this was prophesied in the Old Testament, and I'm going to just read these for you for sake of time here this morning. In Psalms 41, 9, Yea, mine own familiar friend, whom I have trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. And so uh, uh, even this betrayal by Judas Iscariot was prophesied uh, in the Old Testament. And so Satan's at work here, and he's empowering Judas. Now look in uh, verse number 4, And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And so Satan has entered into Judas, and uh, Judas goes seeking them. They didn't come to Judas, he goes to them. Because in Matthew 26 it tells us in verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. So you find that in Matthew 26, verses 14 through 15. Judas goes to them and he says, What will you give me? Judas' God was money. It was never Christ. It was never God the Father. And so Judas was all about the... You remember the Bible said that he's the one that carried the bag and he was the one that was financially uh, in charge of uh, uh, all their money and those things. And so he was a thief and a robber, the Bible calls him. And so uh, he says, what will you give me? And boy, isn't that the echo of the world today. Uh, they're willing to sell out anything just for the dollar. And what will you give me? That was Judas's God there. And so we know that they covenanted uh, 30 pieces of silver and look in verse 5, and they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And of course, Matthew tells us it was the 30 pieces of silver. The Pharisees were glad. They didn't know how to hatch this plot. 
but Judas knew. And look in verse 6, and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him in the absence of the multitude. Now you remember back in verse number 2, the Pharisees are afraid of the people because uh, the people is how they have their position and their power. They have to assert their authority over the people. They have to deceive and fool the people in order to keep their position. And so Christ is exposing them and they have to do away with him. That's their thought. And so, but they feared the people. They feared the multitude. They feared the popular vote as it were. Uh, much like uh, uh, the liberals of the day. Uh, they're trying to do everything they can to stamp out, uh, you know, uh, uh, but I'm not getting into that this morning. That's where they're at. And so they're seeking for an opportunity to betray Christ and to uh, to kill him in the absence of the multitude. So they can't do it during the day when everybody's around. And during this time, remember, Jerusalem is crowded with strangers from all corners of Israel coming into Jerusalem for the feast. But Judas knows. Judas says this. He don't tell them how. He says, what will you give me? And then when they covenant with him, then when they make a promise to pay him, then he tells them how to do it because Judas knew, knew exactly where Jesus was going to be and Judas knew the perfect timing when to get Jesus. Now, uh, uh, flip over the page there in verse number 39 of, of Luke chapter 22 and this is the opportune moment that Judas was looking for that the chief priest was looking for. In Luke twenty-two thirty-nine, 39, and this is after the supper, and he came out and went as he, he was wont, notice that word, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. The Bible says here, Jesus, after this um, Passover, that he would go to the Garden uh, of Gethsemane, or the Mount of Olives there where the Garden of Gethsemane was. And, and the Bible says, as he was wont, or that means as he was used to. And so this was not just something new for Jesus. He had spent many, many hours in this garden, in this particular spot, praying. And Judas knew that after the feast was over that Jesus would resort in, in prayer that night as he would many nights. And you find Jesus many times in the Scriptures alone on a mountain praying in the middle of the night. And so this was nothing uncommon for Jesus. So Judas knew exactly when it was. And it would be on the Mount of Olives. It would be outside of the city. It would be away from the crowds. And the only people that would be surrounding Christ in that garden, that night would have been the disciples and it was the perfect opportunity for them to pounce on Christ and so this is what uh, Judas knew this is what they were glad to hear and so this was the plan but I'm glad that uh, before there was a Satan that God had a plan and in the mind and heart of God God already had this worked out and God knew exactly to the timing. And so though Satan has a plot and Satan has a plan, God always overrules. And we see that even in the book of Revelation, that Satan's going to have a plan to try to overthrow God. But God's plan is greater. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. All right, and so the, during these days preceding the Passover, here's what's going on. Uh, uh, all right, uh, they were, they're coming into the town. Uh, the plot is being hatched by Judas and the chief priests and the elders, and that brings us to verse number 7. All right, and then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. All right, and so the slaying of the Passover was going to be, it was actually going to be, if we look at it in our perspective, it would have been, it would have been Thursday evening at sunset, uh, which would have been the beginning of the 14th day of Nisan the next day. Uh, you know, where we start our, our days at uh, midnight uh, uh, for the next day, like uh, tonight at, uh, at 12.01 will be Thursday morning. Well, the Jews back that up six hours, and their actual, uh, their beginning of the next day began at, Sunset, okay, and so we're already into Friday morning here, and it was on the 14th day of the Feast uh, of Passover, and that was exactly the evening that the lambs were to be uh, slain. All right, and so the Passover lambs had to be killed that evening. And here's what's going on at the temple. Let me read some of this to you here. And when the time of the slaying of the lambs was to happen, it was around sunset uh, of the 14th uh, day of Nisan. So it would have been at the sunset that evening. There would have been three blasts on a trumpet. That's at the temple. And this would initiate the slaying of the lambs. And so each Israelite that evening would have to purchase the lambs. You remember Jesus went into the temple and drove out the money changers? What were they doing? They were selling the animals inside of the temple. And that's why Jesus drove them out. And so everybody would have to purchase a lamb. They were making profit. They were making money. They were making it convenient, much like a fast food society we live in today. And uh, they were selling those animals and desecrating the temple uh, right there. That's why Jesus would drive them out of there But uh, uh, before. But what's happened in every household, every uh, member from every household, usually the head of the household, uh, he was responsible to go and bring the sacrifice, 
the perfect lamb, and he was to bring it to the, the temple that evening in Jerusalem uh, where the, each lamb, each, each household would have to uh, offer their lamb and slay the lamb. And so this is what's going on. So at sunset, there would have been uh, three blasts on the trumpet. This would initiate the slaying of the lambs at the temple. And so there was a procession of all of these households represented in Jerusalem. They were coming with their lambs uh, to be uh, sacrificed there that evening. And so the initiating priest, uh, uh, one at a time, they would come, and uh, one of the one of the priests would be uh, uh, killing the lamb, and then the other, another would catch the blood in a golden cup, and then there was a procession of priests, and they would pass that cup down to the altar, to that brazen altar. Excuse me, that pastor's been talking about, and they would pour that blood out at the, the base of the altar, and that blood being shed. Uh, was the the significance of that. The Bible said in Leviticus 17 that the life of the flesh is in the blood, that that little innocent lamb had given his life and his blood. And as that blood was poured out, they would, they would begin to take those lambs and then they would, they would uh, uh, flay the lamb or they would skin it. And then uh, they would take the inward parts or the, uh, the inside parts and they would burn them. And the lamb would be prepared. And after the lamb was, uh, the blood was shed, and after it was skinned, and after the blood was offered, and after the inward parts was burned upon the, uh, uh, upon the altar there, then uh, that lamb would be given uh, to that family. Now, uh, this is uh, where it, uh, uh, there, there's a blessing here. Now, you remember, I, I had you reading uh, in the, some of the required reading before this, uh, Psalms 113 through 118. All right, and the reason I did that, there's significance here because they're called the Halil Psalms in Hebrews, or we would, that word uh, translates into our Hallelujah Psalms. And so uh, while this was going on, there would be Levites at the temple during this time. They would be singing Psalms 113 through 118. Now that's going to come into significance later at the suppers. We get to this. And again, this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy study, but uh, there's some good things here that I don't want you to miss. It's been a blessing. and My heart's ever thrilled to teach it this morning. And, and it's a joy what I found out because it's made the Bible become so alive. And so can you imagine, get this picture in your head. All of these people standing there with their lambs. And one by one, these lambs being slain. Their blood poured out and the smoke ascending uh, from off of the temple. And, and I can't help but imagine, of course, uh, Jesus sends Peter and John uh, to go prepare before uh, for this Passover. And so they're in line there uh, getting, uh, getting the lamb and those things ready that they have to do. And, uh, and, and Jesus would come into Jerusalem that evening. Uh, uh, can you imagine as he descended down in Jerusalem, seeing this, uh, the beautiful sunset there and the smoke arising from off the altar of all of those lambs that were being slain? And here come the Lamb of God, the final Lamb that would ever have to die. No more sacrifices were needed. As He come into Jerusalem that day, that evening, on, on the exact timing according to the Word of God, on this 14th day of Nisan. You look at it in Exodus chapter number 12. And this is the exact time of this last Passover. And so Peter and John go there to the, uh, to the temple and uh, they, they get the lamb ready for, that they're going to eat, all right? And, and so they're singing these hallelujah psalms. Now it is said there while they were standing in line as uh, the, the psalm was sung, uh, the first line of each psalm would be repeated by the worshipers. And so you go back and read those psalms and put this in your head. And while uh, the, every other line, they responded with a hallelujah. So while they were singing these psalms, these Levites, uh, they would repeat uh, the first uh, line of every psalm. And then, then they would respond with a hallelujah. And tradition tells us that when the... Now this is according to Jewish tradition. This is not in our Bible. But uh, traditionally it said that when they reached the 118th psalm there that they would add three lines and they would say, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, save now thy prosperity. And notice, this is what they would have been singing at the temple. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And isn't that not what they, the, the Jews were chanting there on Palm Sunday as Jesus rode in? said, Hosanna to the highest, and blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's a specific reference to Christ. And they would have been singing that at the temple. And they're, they're singing in, in ignorance because they fail to realize that, that the Messiah, the Lamb of God, is in town that night. The very one that John said, Behold the Lamb, He is there. And so uh, God knows exactly what He's doing. 
And that's what they said, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's what they said on Palm Sunday. But here it's at the temple. That evening they would be reciting that. So look in verse number 8. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And so uh, he sends Peter and John ahead of time. And so part of this preparation would have been they would have had to go to acquire the lamb. They would have had to go to the temple and make the preparation uh, for all of this that was going to happen to bring the lamb back to the household. Uh, they would have, they, they're going to, we're going to see here just in a minute that they're going to have to secure the house uh, where they're going to stay at. And so uh, Jesus sends them ahead uh, to, to, to do this. Now as Peter and John are there, can you imagine what they're seeing and and what they're experiencing with all this being uh, right there at the temple watching these lambs being slayed. And as they would skin these lambs and they would burn the inward parts, they would give the skin to the household, the people coming back uh, like it would be given to Peter and John in this instance. And then this lamb, now, now this is, uh, I don't know if I can uh, not get shook up when I, I, I talk about this. After the lamb was skinned, it was placed on a wooden skewer. You say, well, what's important about that? Well, just in a few short hours, by 9 a.m. the next morning, the Lamb of God will be nailed to a tree and be placed on a cross of wood for you and me. And He would die in our place. And oh, what a significance and oh, what type teaching there is here in this Passover. And so John would and Peter would carry this lamb uh, the, 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 the wooden staff, the pomegranate wood would have been driven uh, from the, the front to the back and they would have been carrying the lamb back to the household skin uh, on that skewer. And what a picture of Christ as He died upon the cross as He shed His blood for our soul. And once they were back to the household, uh, then this lamb was uh, on this skewer was placed upon the fire. You remember back in Exodus, the lamb had to be roasted with fire. It could not be boiled in water. It could not be eaten raw. Why? Because it was a picture of Christ. And this lamb being upon the skewer is a picture of the cross. On this wooden uh, skewer going through it was a picture of the cross being impaled by this wood, being attached, if you will, uh, to this wood. And then uh, the lamb itself had to be roasted with fire. The fire is the symbolic of the judgment of God. And that's exactly what Christ did for us. He took the full wrath of God upon the cross. He took your hell and He took my hell. Friend, if you're listening this morning, you listen to this message and you're not saved, you need to understand what this week is all about. You need to understand why we're so excited and why we're rejoicing that this week we serve a risen Savior, but He died for you and He loves you and He'll save you today. And Jesus suffered your hell. You don't have to die and go to hell because Jesus suffered the wrath of God and the judgment of God for you and died in your place. And if you'll just but believe and call upon His name, right now where you're at, Jesus will save you. Amen. And that's why we're excited because we realize what Christ did for us. It should have been us on that cross. It should have been us experiencing the wrath and the fire of God. But Jesus took the wrath of God without mixture and without dilution. He took the full wrath of God so that you and I could be saved. And what a joy and what a blessing it is to know as we study the Word of God. I'm going to do my best to finish this, but this is exciting stuff. I love to study the Word of God. I love to teach it. It's what God's called us to do, and it's such a joy and such a blessing. I have to turn the windshield wipers on here in just a minute uh, so I can see the Bible. Amen? All right, and so they're, they're going to prepare. And look in verse number 9, and they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And let's read down to verse number 12 or 13. And Jesus says to them, He said unto them, in verse 10, Behold, uh, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water, and uh, follow him into the house where he entered in, entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, that's the head of the house there, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room, look what it says, furnished, there make ready. And they went and found it as he said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And so they were to go. Jesus told them exactly where to go. He told them what house to go to. And look what it says in verse number 10. He says, To say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee. And so we, we, we can deduce from this, we understand from this, that this man, the Bible doesn't tell us who it is, but this man is no doubt a disciple of Christ because when they hear the command from the master, that uh, we're going to see here just in a minute that, that, that he goes above and beyond uh, what Christ asked of him to do. And so no doubt he's a disciple. Some speculate that it's uh, John Mark's father, but we don't have Bible for that, so we can't go out on the limb. But we know, we, we believe that it's a, 
disciple because he responds to the request of the master. Now what we have to understand is what's going on here. We Remember we said that all of these pilgrims are coming from all over Israel into Jerusalem and they're coming uh, to, to these sacrifices to observe the Passover and so there's nowhere for them to stay. And so traditionally what would happen, it was customary that all of the locals in Jerusalem, they would, most of them would have a common guest chamber. It was a common hall that was in their house that they would lend out to all these strangers coming together. You remember the, the God put a lot of importance upon that in the law that you remember all of Israel, they were family, they were brethren, they were to, to take care of one another. And so as they would come to Jerusalem, these, uh, these locals there, they would open up their homes and they, they would have these special rooms uh, that they would allow these other families and groups to come in and observe the Passover in their homes. And so Jesus sends to this particular man, but I want you to notice here, there's something important about this. Uh, notice the word guest chamber here, uh, it's the word, if you look it up in the Greek, it's the word kataluma, and it means a common area. All right, It's the same word uh, that we find in the, the story of the birth of Christ. You remember Mary and Joseph comes into Bethlehem, and the Bible said there was no room for them in the inn or the Cataluma. In other words, uh, it wasn't like a hotel like we thought of, but it was uh, in these homes. There were, you remember, they was all coming into to Bethlehem then uh, because of the census. And so the, the, all the rooms were taken up. There were no room uh, for them in the Cataluma or in the inn. And so Jesus uh, asked this good man of the house, to, uh, it says, where is the guest chamber or the Cataluma? Uh, where I uh, shall eat. But notice, uh, we read in the Bible that the, this man goes one step farther. There was another room in the house. There was another room. It was a larger upper room in the house, and it's called, uh, in the Greek, uh, anageon. An anageon. And it was only reserved for the most honored guest of the house. So this guest chamber is just a common area uh, that they would lend out to anyone. But the upper room, there would be on a set of stairs that would uh, ascend outside of the house and go in a large upper room. It was reserved, a guest chamber, uh, or a uh, we might call it a guest room for the most honored guest. And so this man, no doubt, loved the Lord. And... Um, and he, he didn't give Jesus just the guest chamber, but he gave him that honored room and gave him that honored place for uh, this sacred night. Uh, and we're going to see just in a minute that, that it's the last Passover, but it's the first institution of the Lord's table. And so uh, this man would honor Christ in that, that form. Now, it was customary... Uh, you remember I said back at the temple that they would uh, skin the lambs. They would flay the lambs out. And it was customary uh, as these uh, locals would lend out their, um, their homes to these travelers as they observed the Passover that the, the people, the renters you might say, would leave the, the skin of that lamb, that lamb's hide there uh, for that person uh, in lieu of them letting them use uh, their uh, upper chamber, their room uh, to observe the Passover. And, and what a picture it is here and how that Christ, the Lamb of God, would not only give his life for this man, but for all the world, give his body and give his flesh. And so all so many types and pictures we see here in this story. Now let's look in verse number 14. Well, let me just say this. In verse 13, the Bible says, And they found it, as he said to him, it was already furnished. And so uh, being furnished, the room was already furnished. This man had provided all the supplies they needed. And that would have included the unleavened cakes of bread that they were to eat in observance of the Passover in accordance to Exodus 12. The bitter herbs was there. That, uh, remember, God told them to eat them bitter herbs. It was to remind them of their bondage and the suffering. And it also reminded them of the suffering of Christ. There was a dish with vinegar. That's going to be the sop that Jesus dips his bread with, with uh, Judas there. Uh, the vinegar was there. And then there was going to be unfermented wine. I want to talk about that here just in a minute uh, when we get there. And so again, this is going to uh, go a few more minutes here. Uh, if we have to go, I understand that. But go back and look at it later. Uh, it'll be uh, posted for a while. But there's a lot to go over here. And uh, we, we still got some ground to cover. And then the lamps would have been there. And so all of this was furnished. And, and just as the Lord said, now Jesus told them, you go and you're going to find it the way I say. And you remember uh, before uh, Jesus rode into the town on the donkey, he says for them to go and, and, and he already knew where it was. And so Christ knew ahead of time. All of this is a working according to God's timing. So look in verse number 14 now. 
And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And so now they're sitting down. They're in the upper room and the hour has come. So this is probably sometime right after sunset. Uh, Peter and John have came back with the lamb. Uh, they're in the upper room now ready to observe this feast of Passover. Now as it was customary, if you study, it's not sitting in a chair like we think of. Uh, over uh, over there what they would do is there was these large pillows laid in almost like a U-shape if you would, the table being in the middle, and everyone was laying. It was customary for them to lay uh, up on that pillar on their left side. And so, uh, and if you can imagine, and so the right hand uh, was free to pass the, the, the food and the cup and to eat with, and they was laying on their left side. And so uh, we don't have time to look at all the, the setting there, but you can study the setting. Uh, John would have been the first one here because you remember he's leaning on Jesus' breast. If Jesus is laying on his uh, left side, uh, John would have been right here. He would have been at the first position, Jesus uh, at the next position. And then uh, we believe as we study this that Judas was in the third position. And of course, Peter's all the way on the other end opposite to them in the last position. That's why uh, uh, you read later that uh, we're not going to read that today, but he calls to John and asked uh, him to ask Jesus who it was that would betray him because John is right there as close to the Lord as he can be. But we believe that Judas was in this third position and, and we're not going to read the story about the strife here uh, tonight. At the, but that's what they believe that they were fighting over is that third position because of that third position it was John, Jesus, and then we believe is Judas Iscariot. That third position where Judas was at was supposed to be the most honored position at the table. And so, uh, uh, so uh, Judas set himself above Christ there. And, and so, uh, but anyway, uh, we can, but that's how they were laid. They were laying on their left side, as you can imagine that. They're sitting around the table. That's what the word sat mean, to, to be reclined around that table. And then look in verse 15. And he said unto them, With great desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffered. And so Christ was looking forward to this. And because this was different than the other Passovers, the, the first one was back in Exodus chapter number 12, but this was going to be the last Passover, and because, uh, but it was going to be the first... Uh, of the, uh, the the first ordinance of the church, the Lord's table. And so there's a connection here. Uh, there's a transition here. And so the Passover was given nationally to the nation of Israel. And that was under the Old Testament. And the Passover in the Old Testament, uh, the, the observance of it, was looking to the future Lamb or the Messiah that would come. Now as we're going to see... Uh, this morning that the Lord's table when Christ instituted the Lord's table we look back to the cross we look to the final lamb they were looking future to the lamb but we look to the final lamb they were looking for the future lamb we look to the final lamb because it's in Christ and both of these uh, both of the Passover and the Lord's table was coming together right here at this one event at this what we're going to call the last supper the last Passover it was happening right here and you got to understand that uh, that that God uh, has fulfilled the law in Christ uh, and and all this Passover and all these types and pictures are fulfilled in Christ and Christ is beginning to step into the New Testament here so we see that the Old Testament coming to an end and that's going to end when Christ dies on the cross and the veil is rent in the temple and then we see the New Testament Jesus is going to mention that here just in a minute. And he's going to give a new ordinance of the New Testament, all right? And so uh, he's making them aware of his suffering. Uh, he says in verse 15, he said, With desire, desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so Christ this whole time has been telling him he's going to be crucified. He's going to suffer. He's going to raise again the third day. But uh, later, because of panic, they're going to forget that. They, they neglect that. They fail to remember that. All right, and so uh, Christ is telling them that. But understand this, there, there's a transition going on here. There, we're coming to the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And the Old Testament ends with this last Passover, and the New Testament begins with this first uh, observance of the Lord's table, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. All right, and this is what's going to happen. It's all hinging around one central figure, and that's Christ, the Lamb and the blood. All right, it's all hinging about that, all right? And look in verse number 16. He said, For I say unto you, let's read down to verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not eat any, uh, any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. 
All right, so Jesus says, now notice what he says here. Uh, He says, until the kingdom of God be fulfilled. Now, I'm not going to get into a deep study about that. We've been uh, doing that on Sunday school. When we get back into Sunday school in the young adult class there, uh, we're we're talking about uh, the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven deals with the nation of Israel when Christ will set up his millennial reign. But the kingdom of God covers all ages of time and God's uh, God's final plan of salvation for all mankind. And so uh, what Jesus is saying, to them. He's not going to eat or drink with them anymore until the kingdom of God is fulfilled because what's he getting ready to do? This is going to be his last supper or his last time he eats with them before his resurrection. But now we know after the resurrection in Luke 24, he's eating with his disciples. And in John 21, he's eating with them. And so it's been fulfilled. He said it is finished on the cross. But this is going to be the last time that he has fellowship with him. With them, his loved ones, his dear ones that he loved, the Bible said he loved them to the end in John 13, 1 there. It's going to be the last time of fellowship he has with him before the agony of the garden, before the trials and the cross and uh, his death and all the things he's going to face in the next few hours of his life. Uh, This is all leading up to that. And so this is a time of fellowship. This is the last time, as it were, of peace and relaxation and rest and being around his own uh, before he's going to be forsaken by mom, before he's going to be all alone and endure the agonies of the cross. And so this is why Jesus has looked forward to this and he's looking forward to establishing his church here. And I do want to point this out. Notice what Jesus says in verse 18. He said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. Now, I'm going to mention this, and it may upset some people, but that's okay. But uh, you cannot tell me that Jesus was drinking alcohol and Jesus was drinking wine. It does not, uh, Jesus, and what he's about ready to to present in picture here, uh, he's not going to use an alcoholic drink that causes broken homes and broken marriages and broken lives and deaths and all so much suffering to represent his precious blood. So don't tell me that. And the Bible says, if you go back to verse 20, uh, Proverbs 21, uh, 20 and verse 1, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. But notice Proverbs 31, 4. Write this down and look at it later. Proverbs 31, 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to drink strong drink. You think God's going to break His Word? You think Jesus is going to violate His own commandments? And is not Jesus the King of kings? Is not He the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords? Uh, He is. And so uh, the Bible says it's not for kings to drink wine nor for princes to drink strong drink. And so Jesus is not going to drink alcohol here in the wine. It's unfermented wine. It's been diluted with water. It's not turned yet. The Bible said don't look on the wine when it's red and turning. So this is unfermented wine. This is the fruit of the vine. And so how dare we think or think it's okay that we can use alcohol to represent the precious blood of Christ without spot or without blemish. A drink that has been responsible for the ruined lives of many people, the ruined homes, the ruined lives of children and husbands and wives and many other things that the evil spirit of alcohol and the drink of alcohol does. God forbid that we should associate the precious blood of Christ with something so vile and so ungodly and what Christ is trying to represent here. And so you'll never convince me otherwise, but amen. All right, and so look in verse number 19. We're going to see the institution of the Lord's table. And so Christ uh, instituted this. Now notice, uh, Jesus began His earthly ministry three years prior to this. Jesus began His earthly ministry with the ordinance of baptism. Now what two ordinances does the Lord give to the local church? Well, the first one's believer's baptism, and the second's the Lord's table. And so Jesus began His earthly ministry in identifying with us with the, and gave the ordinance of baptism. And so now, at the end of his earthly ministry, as he's beginning to complete the work of the Father and go, go back to heaven, he's ending his mer- earthly ministry with the second ordinance as he's given to the church, which is the Lord's table. And of course, let's read verses 19 and 20, uh, familiar passages of Scripture. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and brake it, and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given uh, for you, this do in remembrance of me. And likewise also the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. Now notice those two phrases in verse 19 and 20. In verse 19, His body was given for you. And notice in verse, or excuse me, 19 and verse 20, He said, It's my blood which is shed for you. Notice that word for. 
It was in your place. Jesus gave His body in your place. Jesus gave His life's blood. That's the the ultimate thing that Christ could give. His very life for you and I to be saved. His blood was shed for you and for me. And His body was given for you and for me. And the, 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 of course, we see the broken bread. Here is a picture of Christ's body uh, we, as we celebrate the Lord's table. And Hebrews 10.10 10 says, "...by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ." Once and for all. I would encourage you to go back and read Hebrews uh, 9 and 10. Uh, that gives insight on this right here. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the bread here being symbolic of his body, as Jesus would say in John six thirty five. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And so as we partake in Christ's body, uh, now uh, we're not teaching uh, the, the Catholic false doctrine of transubstantiation. Uh, the wafer does not become Christ's literal friend. Uh, flesh in our mouth and the cup does not become his blood spiritually in our mouth uh, because to do so is to crucify the Son of God afresh and the Bible said in that he died, he died unto sin once and so uh, this whole ceremony is symbolic uh, and, and, and some priest cannot invoke the Spirit of Christ in a wafer or in the cup and so we don't believe in transubstantiation, that's a false doctrine it's of the pits of hell, it's of the devil and no priest on earth has that power to do that. Christ was our high priest he's our prophet and king and once for all forever, he offered his body. And this bread that we partake of is picture. It's symbolic. As, as baptism does not save us, nor does the Lord's table save us, uh, it's, a, it's symbolic. It represents what Christ has done for us, his broken body. And as he's the bread of life given for us, and as, he, uh, as his hands and feet were pierced, and the whip would go across his back, and the crown of thorns on his brow, and as they beat him, it's so very uh, important to understand that his body was, 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 was bruised. The Bible said he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And so it, it represents his broken body. Now understand that none of the bones of Christ were broken in accordance to Psalms 22. And uh, we know uh, in the book of John tells us that his bones were not broken. Uh, and so that did not happen. But his flesh and his body was open. It was cut. And he was bleeding. And, and, and uh, the Bible said that he wasn't even recognizable as a man. And Isaiah chapter 52 says that. And so the, 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 the bread represented the broken body of the Lord, but the cup represented the blood which is shed. And Hebrews 9, 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered once in the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And of course Hebrews 9, 22, later in that chapter, said, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. And so without this shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus said, It's shed for you. Uh, to forgive your sins. And so he institutes the Lord's table here. And so now uh, we, we've got a few more minutes here and probably about 10 minutes will be done. If you'll just bear with me that, that amount of time. There is just so much here we can't cover it in that short period of time. But I don't want to cut this off and do it later. I'm going to go through. And so if you need to come back and look at it later, that's fine. But I want us to go on now to verse 21. So we see the Lord's table instituted. And let's read uh, 21 to 23. Now we're going to see the betrayer exposed. Jesus is going to expose Judas. But behold the hand of him, this is Jesus speaking, that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to inquire amongst themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And what I want you to do now uh, is uh, if you'll go on over to the book of John and flip over to the book of John, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, go from there. In ver- or chapter 13, in John chapter number 13 and verse 21, and uh, this goes along with what we just read in Luke 22, and uh, we'll be here in John uh, 13. And I want to read down to verse 31 here. And uh, what's happening here it gives you more of an insight. Because there's so many things happening right now. And, you know, we just read over this and we skim over it, but there's so much there. And I'm, I'm just scratching the surface of it. Uh, but there's so much depth here that we need to get. But look in verse 21 of John chapter 13. And when Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one upon another, doubting whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now that was John. You remember they're laying on their left side. So John is right here. Jesus is here. 
Judas is next to him. Judas has to be the next one because who does Jesus share the sop with? He shares it with Judas. So Judas had to be the next one. In that elevated position, he set himself above Christ. All right, and look uh, in uh, verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. We know that's John. And then verse 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned unto him that he should ask who it who it should be of whom he spake. And so Peter, if you can imagine, across the table directly from John on the end, uh, he's beckoning or motioning to Peter, or excuse me, Peter's motioning to John to ask Jesus who it is. And then verse 25, He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? And verse 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, now look in verse 27, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. Now this is another time. See, two days earlier, Satan entered to him but as he went to the uh, chief priest. But now again, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. And so he has to be the next one in line. Jesus shares the sop with him, and Jesus is speaking to him. The other disciples don't hear what they're saying. And so uh, he has to be the next one beside Christ. And so no, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, By those things which we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And so this is what's happening. They're sitting at the table, and uh, Jesus uh, uh, is burdened because he knows one of them will betray him, uh, one of the pretenders. And boy, there's many pretenders today. You see, you can't pretend to be a Christian because God knows if you are or you're not. Jesus knew exactly what Judas was going to do, and so he sent him on his way, and he was filled with Satan. He was entered by Satan to go do his evil deed, and Jesus knew what was going to happen that night. And that's why Jesus tell, told them to watch and pray. He knew that the forces of hell were moving that night. He said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. He knew the devil was trying to keep him from going to the cross and he knew he was trying to trip up the disciples. That's why Jesus told them to watch and pray but they fell asleep. But now he's entered into Judas and Judas leaves. Now the reason we're in John I want to point this out to you. From John 13 to the end of John 17 we see the private conversation with Jesus and his disciples. The Gospel of John records more of the private conversations of Christ than any of the other Gospels. The Gospel of John does that. And so here we see this private conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Now, Judas has already left. And what we read about John 14, 15, and 16, about the coming of the Holy Spirit, about the mansion in heaven, about Jesus' high priestly prayer, and all those blessed things that we read uh, in John 13, 14, and uh, 15, and through 17, 16, 17, Judas is gone. And so Jesus is sharing this intimate relationship. He's given them specific instructions for His church. He's telling them the Holy Spirit's going to come, that He's going to guide them, He's going to lead them, and He's given them specific instructions. And so Judas is not involved because he's not one of the twelve originally. I mean, he was there amongst them, but, but he's, not, he's not privy to this uh, information. You see, the world can play like a Christian, but they don't know the Holy Spirit. They don't know the power. They don't know the deep things of God, the sweet things of God that God shares to you and I that are saved. And so Christ is having this communion and this fellowship with them during this time around the table. And so that's what's happening here. And so when we get to John 18, we find Jesus in the garden. And so from the end of John 13 to John, the end of John 17, Jesus is having this private conversation with the disciples. There's one more point about this whole thing, and I want to wrap it up here, uh, that I want to point out. Now, uh, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, but there's just so much here, and I love to teach this, and this has been such a blessing to me, and I wanted to share it with you. And uh, this, I, I'm going to end on a high note if I can. Uh, there's such a blessing in what I want to show you here. And this is one of the verses that, that I've read a hundred times. Uh, every time we do communion, we quote this verse. And, uh, but but I, until recently, and I started studying for these lessons for these teenagers, I, I overlooked many things about this. But look in Matthew 26 and verse number 30. And uh, it says the same thing in Mark 14, 26. But look in verse 30. And when they had what? Sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Mark 14, 26 says exactly the same thing. Matthew Mark the one tells us that after this supper was ended, after Jesus uh, prayed His high priestly prayer in John 17, before He goes to the garden, the Bible said they sung a hymn and went out. Now during this time of the Passover... 
Uh, you remember we said back at the temple that the Levites were singing while the lambs were being slayed, Psalms 113 through Psalms 118, the Halil Psalms or the Hallelujah Psalms. Well, those Psalms were not only sung at the temple, but they were sung at the table the night of the Passover. And uh, the, the cup would have been passed four times around the table. And, uh, and each time uh, after the second passing uh, of the cup, uh, the Psalms, one eight, uh, excuse me, Psalms 113 and 114 were sang at the second passing of a cup. And at the fourth and final passing of the cup, Psalms 115 and 118 were sung. And so uh, what, what was Israel's hymn books? It was the Psalms. And it was the Psalms. And so uh, the, the very last song that Jesus sang before He went to the cross was Psalms 118. And Psalms 118, not by coincidence, but by the divine sovereignty of Almighty God, happens to be a messianic psalm. In other words, a psalm that has prophetic significance for the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, if, and if you'll bear with me to time, I want you to, and we'll finish there, I want you to turn to Psalms 118. And I want you to tell me, I want you to see if, if our God does not know what He's doing. Keeping that in mind, they've passed the fourth cup. The Bible said they sang a hymn and went out. The last hymn, the last song they would have sang was Psalms 118. Jesus is singing this. It's a messianic psalm. It has all to do with this time that Christ, during this Passover. Now I want us to read, and there's some things. I'm going to try to keep from shouting, but there's some good things. I want to read the whole chapter. But as you read this, this is why I was wanting you to read the psalms, to get this in mind. I want you to picture Jesus with His disciples, this last cup being passed, Him singing this song. This is the last song that Jesus is going to sing before He goes to the cross, and this is what He's singing. Look at what it says in verse 1 of Psalms 118. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, because His mercy endureth forever. He's giving thanks to God. He knows what's getting ready to happen in a few short hours. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be forsaken. He's going to be ridiculed. He's going to be smitten. But He's saying, give thanks to the Lord, for He's good. Let Israel now say that His mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that His mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that His mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Notice what verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. Here just in a few short hours, the depravity of man was going to come to a climax. Man and all his evil, wicked influences and deeds, all that he could do, he's going to crucify his Creator, going to spit in his face, going to mock him. But the Bible says that the Lord was on Christ's side. He's not going to fear what man can do to me. The Lord taketh my part, in verse 7, with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. And that's going to be true one day. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Because every man forsook Jesus, even his disciples. So his trust was in the Lord. Verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Jesus' trust wasn't in Pilate to let him go. Jesus wasn't at the feet of Pilate begging for his life. He was in silence. Verse number 10, look at this. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. So the Romans were there. The Jews were there. Jesus was hung outside the gates, outside of the city walls, the Bible said. On that road as it was coming into the Jerusalem and people coming and going from all the nations, coming and going from all Jerusalem would have looked upon Christ. Look in verse 11. They can pass me about. Yea, they can pass me about. But in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. Notice the word thorns there. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord help me. Notice in verse 14, the Lord is my strength. And what does it say? My song. Understand, Jesus is singing this song, the last song he'll sing before he dies, and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. And by the way, who's seated at the right hand of the Father? We know that's Christ. The Bible said when He was finished by Himself in Hebrews 1.3, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. 
But notice verse 17. Now look at it. Jesus is singing this right before he dies. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Oh, I'm trying to contain myself. This is such grace. This is such beauty, such joy. Jesus knows that he's going to die, but he knows he's not going to stay dead. He knows that three days later he's going to come up out of that grave. And I'm glad that we serve a risen Savior today. But he's singing this. Look in verse 18. The Lord has chastened me sore, and he hath not given me over unto death. Now, we know that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, according to Isaiah 53. Verse 19, Open to me the gates of the righteous, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. Now notice this great prophetic verse according to Christ here in verse 22. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Of course, Peter tells us about that. We know who that is. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And verse number 24 is the one that about knocked me on my back. Jesus is singing this, knowing He's ready to die, knowing the hours at hand that He's going to be betrayed, that all the forces of hell are coming against Him, that every man's going to turn against Him. Notice what Jesus is singing. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 12, that for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus is saying, this is the day that the Lord hath made. God had planned in all eternity past, this was the day that God had planned, and our salvation hinged upon this day and this time. And Jesus said, this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And boy, I'm glad that He faced that cross, and I'm glad for that day, and we can rejoice in that day. And Jesus is rejoicing because He wanted more sons in glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 25, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, and send now prosperity. Blessed, look at this, we've already read this today. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Jesus is the light of the world. Now look what it says here. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. Jesus will be nailed to that cross in just a few short hours. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Oh, what a Savior and what a God that we have. And I know we've been a little bit long today, but I hope this study has been a blessing. It has thrilled my heart. It thrills me to teach it. It thrills me to study it. It thrills me to share it. The wonderful message of what a Savior that we have today that was willing to endure all of this shame and all of this agony and all of this suffering just so some filthy sinner like you and me can be saved. And friend, if you're listening and you're not saved, Jesus died on that cross for you. He loves you today. He wants to save you. And the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And you can see Easter in a different light and in a way that you've never seen it before. If you're not saved, you can trust the Lord. He'll save you right where you're at. Just simply call out to Jesus Christ. Believe that He died for you and you're a sinner and ask Him to forgive you and come into your heart and He'll save you right here. Now, if you do that, we'd like to... Uh, to let you uh, let us know about that so you contact us and I thank you for being patient with me today and tuning in and again I hope it's been a joy and a blessing uh, please share this on your Facebook post and a uh, pastor will be back again this evening at seven o'clock uh, for our uh, Bible study in the book of Exodus and Leviticus that he's teaching at 530 for teenagers and at 630 uh, we're going to tell the resurrection story uh, to our master clubbers at 630 uh, using uh, the the object lesson with those uh, resurrection eggs so I hope you tune in. God bless you. We love you. We're praying for you. You pray for us. Amen.